Sell. To sell. Yeah. Hey everyone, welcome back to Sell to Sell. My name is Heem, that's Nick. And today we have Jake Nemechek with us. How you doing, bro? I'm good. How are you guys doing? What's up, Jake? I'm good. Glad to have you on, man. So Jake is an undergrad here at Case. Um, you're pre-med, right? So yeah. saying like, like what, biochem? Biochem, yeah. Biochem, yeah. gross. <laughs> um, so Jake, just tell the people a little bit about yourself. Hold on, before we start, before we start, not oh. to cut you off. Please like and please subscribe. Please like subscribe. <laughs> Jeez, please. Like, we just had to do that. It's a YouTube thing. We always forget to do that. But. Uh, the, the few new people that have come, you know, from the Spanish podcast, we just posted last Friday. That would be really cool. Yeah. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, but, yeah, just like and subscribe, comment, ask questions, email us. We have fun doing this. Even if, even if you don't watch past this point, just share. It's fun. Okay. Tell us background, a little about yourself. Um interests how you got to case yeah. all that kind of stuff all right yeah so uh i'm jake from portland oregon i'm 19 years old born in 2003 um i came to case because my parents actually met here hey no That's way wild. so that kind of sparked my interest and you know just put it on my radar and i realized that it's actually a really good uh pre-med school pre-med something i've always wanted to go into and um so i applied and got in and now I'm here yeah. is this the only like undergrad you applied to or well, did you did you where else did you where apply, else did you apply? Uh, I applied to a bunch of I went to a small liberal arts school for my high school so I applied to a bunch of schools like that I'm gonna be honest I hated my, my high school so I didn't <laughs> want to go to any of those programs like uh, small colleges in California and I they just I wanted a you know a different scenery um, so I decided to come to Case, and I love it here, you know. You wouldn't like the big college experience of, like, going away from home, but, like, like I went to a small university. Like, I went to a place called Thomas More, yeah. and it was a small liberal arts, Christ, like, Catholic <laughs> Christian university, right? So, like, getting, like, the full college experience was different, especially because it was so small, and I was, like, 10 minutes away from home. So, like, I kind of get, like... That's how I felt about coming to grad school was I wanted to like break that mold of, you know, small Catholic, lib like artsy. It's like, no, I want to go just experience yeah, it. Getting out of the bubble. So what do your parents do? Like, how did they meet here? Like, what was? Yeah. So um, my mom was here for residency at, uh, at Rainbow Babies just up on Adelbert. Um, and my dad had just gotten into... Uh, into medical school here at Case. And so um, they met at, I think, one of the... Bars. Jolly Scholar. I, I, <laughs> they met somewhere here. And, yeah. So now my dad's, uh, he's, a, he's a neurosurgeon, and my mother is a pediatric oncologist. That's amazing. That's insane. Yeah. That's, That's incredible. Really cool. So it makes sense that you want to do pre-med. Now, do you want to do any of the neurosurgery or pediatric oncology stuff? Um... Yeah, so growing up, both my parents would always, you know, show me what they were doing in work, like the CT scans mm -hmm. and the data, and, you know, they'd tell me about their patients, even though that's kind of illegal. Um, <laughs> they just, they're not allowed to say that. <laughs> yeah, they didn't say their name. They didn't they say their name. They didn't they say their name. name. This is the case we saw. Uh, anyways, right? um, yeah, I used to really be interested into the brain and, you know, kind of the scans my dad was showing me. Um, I thought it was pretty fascinating, but I had, there was a, Slight turn of events my senior year of high school. I lost a close family friend of mine who was my mom's patient to uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Mm -hmm. And that kind of just made, like, our, our community was just devastated at school. And my mom was heartbroken. And I was really sad, too, mm -hmm. because, you know, I would go to this kid's backyard right. when yeah. I was younger and, you know, play with him. Um, and so... When that happened, I kind of started looking more towards what my mom was doing, you know, hematology, oncology, because there is so much we don't know about cancer. Mm -hmm. And so I want to figure out what we don't know, you know. So you're pre-med, but you want to go to medical, and you want to go to medical school. Yes. Do you have any intention of trying to apply for, like, uh, you know, MSTP track, like, you know, an MD, PhD? Yeah, yeah. Do research and practice yeah md phd is the degree i'm going for. okay that's nice because i love research i've done extensive leukemia research um in oregon and i also want to work with kids and help them because i i get along with them really well and mm -hmm. 
I want to, you know, see him recover. Yeah. You know, the best part about, like, working with kids is that, like, that's when you can change the course of their life. If you can cure totally. disease before they're developed as in a human, like, as an adult, you can avoid, like, a lot of things that, you know, adults can't really change, like, or, or if you give an adult gene therapy versus a kid, they have way more long-term yeah. changes. Yeah, more, like, stuff. receptible and everything. Yeah. yeah. So, Jake, this is a, you know, a regenerative medicine themed podcast. <laughs> So kind of like, we like to kind of, like other people who aren't necessarily in this, like we like to ask a question of like, what do you know about regenerative medicine? Like, when did you learn about stem cells? And kind of like, what do you know? What have you learned in your coursework? Because it's interesting to see from all the backgrounds that we came from, like we all kind of have different ideas of what they were. And then when we got into our program, we kind of got an under, a better understanding, a better grasp. But like as an undergrad here at Case, you know, where mesenchymal stem cells were founded like by Arnold Kaplan like yeah. what like what is your take on stem cells and like how do you do you see that in any potential future as an MD PhD yeah. well I mean I remember learning about stem cells and like junior biology just as you know these um, undifferentiated cells that can turn to whatever you want I was like oh that's cool yeah but, um, as I'm looking into it like regenerative medicine it's it's a very nuanced field. It's it's full of you know potential applications, gene therapy, uh, something I'm really interested in, um, especially because you know cancer is entirely congenital. Mm -hmm, um, yeah. So gene therapy is you know very promising, very interesting, um, and yeah, I mean regenerative medicine is awesome. How much of how much of like viral vectors have you covered in your? I, so you're only a sophomore, right? I'm only a sophomore. You're only a sophomore. So I guess you haven't taken any like upper level biology classes yet have you like your cellular biologies your virologies your molecular genetics like that kind of stuff have you taken any of that yet no but we've covered it we've covered and I've it. also worked with viral vectors and I was gonna say so and I was gonna say later like kind of elaborate on your research you said you mentioned that you worked in leukemia research kind of yeah. like what did you do you know especially as an undergrad and you said even as a as a, like a senior in high school you had the opportunity to work so like you know, how has that job changed over time and like what has that experience, you know, given you for like your future career? Yeah, so um, I was part, I, I worked in the Knight Cancer Institute in Portland, Oregon, um, funded by Phil Knight. It's part of the big hospital there called Oregon Health Science University. Mm -hmm. um, and I was um, taken under the wing of Dr. Jeff Tyner, who's working in um, acute myeloid leukemia AML lab. Um, and I came there just completely clueless about, you know, the mechanisms and how everything worked. And um, I learned that, you know, the maturation level of these cells, so like how, how uh, developed they are, mm -hmm. are, there's a direct relationship between that and their resistance to the, one of the only drugs that can treat AML. And so what I was doing um, during my time there was kind of basically exploiting the maturation pathways of these cells through treating them with a drug called uh, retinoic acid. You guys might know it as retinol to get mm -hmm. rid of like wrinkles in your face. Yeah, but is retinoic yeah, acid like an anti-inflammatory, like? For the skin? It's like, kinda. It, it's like an anti-aging. Yeah, yeah. It like tightens things up is like the point of it. Yeah. I don't know how, I don't know the mechanism. I don't know skin. how it works in the skin, but in these <laughs> drugs. But in this drug, how, yeah, yeah. And in, 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 in these leukemia cells, it binds to a receptor, which basically causes them to, uh, to differentiate. And so I was seeing, um, you know, which pathways are being upregulated by uh, this drug Atra, mm -hmm. um, and just ide uh, basically identifying them. And so I did identify like the proteins that are being upregulated and downregulated and whatnot. And so I'm going to come back this summer and try and find out the actual pathways that are modulating the expression levels of these proteins. Okay, I know we try to keep it not too scientific on here. And like, you know, the goal is like, if my mom, who has no idea what science I'm studying, is watching this, she can kind of understand. But I'm going to ask you a technical question. Um, were you running like RNA-seq and RT-PCR? And like, what kind of protein assays were you running? A little bit of RNA seq to see, like, you know, um, what pro what like protein, overall expression. Yeah, yeah, just like if there's any downstream proteins, mm -hmm. or if that's like the main protein that is, you know, initiating the cascade. Okay. Um, 
most of it was Western blot, which was painful. That's horrible. <laughs> it, was, it was painful. That's just But horrible. I just had to kind of see, I would put on all these apoptotic, like, like cell death proteins and kind of look at, oh, what's being up regulated and what's being down regulated. Mm-hmm. And I kind of put, the, put them together. Western blots are horrible. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, I have a family, like I never grew up in India, but I'm like Indian. All my family's yeah. back in India. And one of my cousins' mom, like my aunt, had AML like a year before COVID. Yeah. So like when like I was wrapping up my undergrad, I was also like really motivated. And like I, I absolutely love this family with all my heart. And like seeing my mom so upset about seeing her sister pass away was like so motivating. And then just reading the entire internet about like what stem cells are, like acute myeloid leukemia, like some people have said, like if if I were to choose a cancer to get, the last one I would choose is AML. Oh yeah, really? Because it's literally AML is like your like your entire white blood cells are like killing yourself, right? Is that describe AML a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's uh, it's a cancer of the of the bone marrow, mm-hmm. and all the cells bear these myelocytic markers. So the red blood cells. Yeah. yeah. So like, what's physically happening though? Um, so like what's attacking what? Because like I can tell you like in a graft versus host disease when we get like a bone marrow transplant like the graft is literally attacking yeah. the host body like because it's like this is foreign like yeah. we need to destroy mm-hmm. this. Yeah so it's it's just like all of these blood cells in your body your bone marrow cells are just being taken over by these cancerous cells and it's I mean you need blood to function right? Right. So your organs are shutting down and it's just it's it's a terrible terrible disease is it like mainly like t cells b cells like what like what kind of cell, or is it just like all myeloid cells well your bone marrow has a myeloid and a lymphoid well, lineage yeah, yeah, so yeah. like you're yeah destroying you're just destroying everything everything, everything. Okay. literally it's the worst cancer to have effect it's hmm. it's awful so how so how do we turn that off and that's what jake's studying that's, that's what jake's studying out. that's awesome yeah that's great what how are you are you like familiar with the whole umbilical cord banking and all that stuff no i haven't looked at that mm. yet well like that's like one thing for blood cancers which is a huge thing that we've learned about because like cleveland cord blood is a company here that yeah. like stores a bunch of umbilical cords mm. and like it's just wild that you know sometimes if your leukemia has like metastasized then you need way like four or five doses of this umbilical cord versus early detection and all those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just crazy though. A lot of the treatment is based in um, transplant. Mm-hmm. So bone marrow transplant. Yeah. And I've, I've um, actually started uh, an organization here called Be The Match that helps these people with uh, blood cancers like AML find uh, transplant donors. How many donors awesome. have you? How many donors have you matched so far? Um, so we are just you like started, at that? Are you like? Are you? At, I was gonna say. Or are you at the point where you can do that? We ju- we just started uh, the organization. We had a drive about a month ago where we got sixty people on the registry. That's awesome. So yeah, that's awesome. Um, those people won't necessarily donate. I'm on the registry. I won't necessarily donate. But if they find a potential um, like a match donor, yeah, or match, yeah, it, they'll. Be sent in. So you don't, you guys don't necessarily blood draw people, but people who come in, you just sign up your name. Yeah, you just swab your cheek, um, and they take it into a lab and um, basically match up um, these immune markers to see mm-hmm. if they, if you can um, donate. Because if there's a mismatch, the the transplant will just do well, so much damage. Oh yeah, patient. absolutely. <laughs> oh absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. It's yeah. really cool building up like a really good resume. So not only that, though, like, it's, it's such a good and doing an engine is a good, good time. Well, that's the yeah. be- well, that's the best part about it. Like I think is like it's you're not just like it's not like just like volunteer hours. Mm-hmm. I don't know, like somewhere it's like actually like pushing things. I think that's awesome. So do you plan on like taking the MCAT next year? As a junior, or are you going to take it as a senior and take a gap year? I'm going to take the MCAT my summer of junior year, I think. Okay. So no gap year. Yeah, no gap year. Are you going to apply to Case? Probably. Might as well, <laughs> right? Probably. He's he's legacy, and he's... Yeah. Well, technically, your mom, she was Rainbow Children's, right? So is that affiliated with Case? Um, 
They would have been with UH, right? They I'm would sure. have been with UH. UH. But still, like this area. Yeah. yeah. They just moved. They just recently moved to the clinic. They've been with UH forever. Who did? Case Medical School. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just moved down the road. To where? Cleveland Clinic, all those new buildings is the new medical school. For Case? Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. Wait, when? Uh, Recently. Like at the beginning of like the fall semester this year, they moved You're everything kidding. over there. Yeah. yeah, they moved from UH. That's why like the dental building and like the nursing, like the nursing building, it's all over there. Yeah. Like it's like a new health sciences. Oh. Yeah. So they don't really they don't really partner. Is that what HEC is? The Health Education Campus yep. or not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, that's actually dope. And it's actually so nice. Have you been over there? Yeah. It's so nice. It's beautiful. It's so nice. It's great. Have Can't you done like uh, scribing and stuff before, like working with hospital people? I've not done scribing. I was a greeter at a, at a, a clinic in Portland that services mostly the immigrant community, the Virginia Garcia Memorial Health Clinic. That's really cool. Yeah, and so... I would have people coming in, you know, and getting appointments and stuff. And I speak, most of them speak Spanish, so they'd come up to me and, oh, I don't speak English. And I'm yeah. just uh, helping out <laughs> in Spanish. Um, and, yeah, it was, a, it was a great experience, you know, both for my language and also just being exposed to new people. That's awesome. Yeah. How do you know Spanish? Um, my mom is Puerto Rican. And so Aye. I've been exposed to it. <laughs> I've been exposed to it since I was a kid, you know, visiting my mom's family. Yeah. Took it for multiple years in high school, and taking it now, even though it's only Spanish 102. Right. You know, I'm just... <laughs> stay, <laughs> stay involved somehow. Yeah, I'm still learning something. Yeah. Never know. Do you, so does your mom speak to you in Spanish at all? Uh, when, she's when she gets mad. <laughs> <laughs> when she gets mad sometimes. That's um, funny. But, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, we're not in medical school, but, like... Yeah. Do you have any questions for like grad <laughs> students? Like as a, I know, I know if I was in your seat, I would have so many questions for graduate students. And you know, I'm not, I'm kind of putting you on the spot a little bit, and I don't mean to be, no, but like, right. but like, it's yeah. different. It's di it's different. It's a Our lot. Our master's program is definitely a little interesting. You yeah. know about RGME? Yeah, yeah, a yeah. little bit. I hear about your classes and stuff. So, yeah. I like. I mean, I just got out of undergrad what now almost a year ago like mm -hmm. I graduated and like my life a year ago was so much different than what I am now and like I know like there are medical students that like I've met up here and their life is totally different than what it was when they were an undergrad oh, yeah. and, like you think that like I don't know a lot of them are kind of like it's like a job like they go to class to go and study until like a certain time and like they do their thing and like med school is supposed to be like all this hell of two years or four years and like no time to do anything but like they're living life yeah. like they're having fun like like they still get to do the things that they, they want to do and like I don't know I think that was a misconception that I had like going into grad school was like oh my god I'm have no time like nothing no it's yeah. it's chill it's do you chill. do you like Cleveland area like how's the weather different to back home oh like night and day like the really? weather in Portland is for the most part really nice like 60s clear Really? Does it ever snow in Portland? Portland? It yeah. normally doesn't, but it has been these past few years. That's weird. It'll get, I mean, it, during the fall and winter and stuff, it'll get pretty bad. But, you know, once April hits, it's really consistent. Like here, we'll get a wet, like a good week of weather, and then it starts snowing, you know? Like last week? That won't happen in Oregon. Last week was 70, like it was 75 degrees three days in a row, and this week it's been like... 39 40 41 horrendous Horrible. horrendous it's been awful but yeah the the cleveland area itself um cleveland's an interesting place especially like university circle because it's kind of like a bubble mm -hmm. you know it's really nice and gentrified here and um but if you travel like half a mile down My, uh like yeah. east you'll see a bunch of things you don't really want to yeah. see yeah and if you travel if you continue east, like, just keep going, like, it's the same kind of thing. It kind of reminds me of, like, back home, because, like, again, I'm from northern Kentucky, right across the river from Cincinnati, and I believe if that river wasn't there, like, I would just be, like, a citizen of Cincinnati. Because, mm -hmm. like, like, you just, like, you go out of downtown, you're in Kentucky, and, like, you just drive 15 minutes, and, like, you're, like, in, like, suburbs and, like, all these shopping malls and all this kind of stuff. I drive 15 minutes 
east of where I live, like right in University Circle. And it just, it's like the same kind of vibe at home, just like a bunch of stuff. So yeah. other than the weather, I think Cleveland's pretty comparable to like where I live. It's just like my family's back there. That's the only reason. Yeah. But would, so like when you're done, say worst case scenario, you don't get accepted to case. What would be like your like top school you would want to go to? Um, either University of Washington uh, or OHSU in Oregon because they have a really good MD PhD program. Nice. Yeah. And there's a bunch of opportunities for pediatrics there, like we're on Walmart's Dornbecker Clinic. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. How do you know I'm gonna speak? How do you know? I hear you. You hear me go? <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyways. Um, uh, I very much. Yeah, I did forget my question. Um, so as an undergrad, you know, I'm sure you've done it with your parents. I'm sure they didn't have, know a bunch of people. You're able to shadow, right? Have you, I, like, okay, shadowing doctors cool, but have you ever shadowed, like, like an MD-PhD or, like, talked to an MD-PhD? Yeah, yeah, I have. So this, uh, actually, this, like, spring break a few months ago, mm -hmm. I had a chance to talk to uh, one of my mom's mentees who is an MD-PhD at OHSU, which nice. is exactly what I want to do, you know? So, you know, we sat down. Are they AML? Huh? Are they AML research? Oh, AML. Uh, they're hemonc. Yeah, yeah. So oh, hell. Hemonc. There you go. Yeah. So um, I had the chance to talk to him and hear about his life. And it, like, it sounded great. You know, he told me he still had some free time. <laughs> some free time. Some, some free time. Emphasis on the sum. <laughs> but um, the only thing is, like, money can be hard. But... As an MD PhD, so yeah. I was just saying, actually, yeah, I mean it's seven that, years yeah. of schooling. Yeah, but but like don't I don't know about making a nice salary. No, yeah, so too. fun fact: and this MD PhD program at Case was the first one formed in the United States by the NIH. Yeah, and I don't know if it's this is the reason why, but uh, the MD PhD program here is fully paid for. So is that not the case for? Yeah, MD PhDs are fully paid. You get a stipend. And you yeah, get around you like get, thirty to forty thousand dollars a year. They're you're getting paid. Absolutely. That's why yes. they're so competitive. It's, a, it's, a it's free medical school and free, free PhD. Completely free eight years worth of education, and you get paid during your PhD portion. Okay. Usually people tell you if you go for a PhD and you're, you have to pay for it, don't do it. Seriously. Like in science, if you, have to get, if, you have to get, if you have to pay for a PhD, don't do it. They should be paying you. Like a PhD that works in like my lab, he gets a stipend every year for being a PhD at Cates. Right? That's usually how it thought. That's it usually how it is. So like MST, MSTP uh, program program students, they it's all, definitely they get paid to go to medical school. We've talked to like a couple of MD PhD mm -hmm. students. They tell us, yeah, it's one of the biggest reasons they chose it. Not the only reason. Like, right. Yeah, Case has a really good school too, but like, dude, financially, going yeah, you're like fine. five hundred thousand dollars of debt after medical school versus that's hard. Yeah. If and you're like, if you're getting like it's I mean, granted, it's not a lot of money. It's dude, not like you're gonna be living large, but like it's enough to get by for seven years yeah. and then you come out with no student debt and then you can just start making money and investing and living your life rather than having that ball and chain of debt. Yeah. Well I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah when you learn cool something today, it's really cool. Dude yeah. MD PhD is such like a it's such like a cool like it's a, track. It's, it's a very cool track. It's so I don't know. It's just unique. And I think that there's not one MD PhD that's the same. And I think that's super, super cool. Yeah. Because I've worked with a couple of MD PhDs in like my in the lab I work in. And like uh they're all I mean they're, they're so in their nice. element though. Yeah. Like yeah. that's yeah. one thing in common between it. all of them. They're like Bro, they're just yeah. about it. It's ten years of like conf confirming you're you're here. But I'm yeah. telling you, one of the MD PhDs I work with, she comes to work. We'll do our stuff, and we'll sit there and we'll talk about like beer and traveling. So like she's living it up, but she's also kicking butt in the lab. Already done her first two years of medical school, passed her uh, boards oh, and like her phase ones, and like now she's like, I get to do my PhD, and then I get to do lab rotations. Yeah. And, like, that's awesome. Yeah. That's, like, the life. That would be the life. Yeah. I am not. I wasn't smart enough to do that. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. for me, I just feel like the MD-PhD degree in oncology would be very applicable. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the whole field is using these therapies, and the therapies aren't always going to work. 
and as I've seen, the drugs that you ma- that you make are gonna stop working eventually. So, uh, do you, what do you know about like the FDA and the pipeline of how drugs are created and made and pushed through? I not much. Not much. Not much. So like only from like what you might have heard from like COVID, like phase one, phase two, phase yeah, three, yeah. like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a wake up call. It is. The FDA is they they're when we sit here and talk about you know, it's great to sit here and talk about cell therapies, gene therapies, viral vectors, AVVs, whether it's in vivo and cell culture and all that kind of stuff. It's great and it's being used. And some of it's FDA approved. But a lot of these like novel drugs that we're talking about are 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years away. And like the things that you'll be working on, like it takes 10 to 12 years to go from concept to, you know, bedside. Yeah. Granted, that's time, I'm, what I probably have with that in our classes, a lot of times that's for like small molecular drugs because you're looking at like analogs and stuff. Cell therapies, I think, could maybe move faster or slower depending on what they are. Mm. So like, if you already have something kind of established and you're just kind of like branching off of something that's already working, you know, maybe you're looking at like, you know, two years of animal testing, applying safety trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, push through. But like uh, Betty Cell is one that comes up to mind. It's a, it's a gene therapy for beta thalassemia, oh. which is like, it's a blood, yeah. it's a blood um, issue. It's a genetic issue. And, you know, it took them 12 years and the two days they uh, proposed their stuff in front of the FDA, it was like, it was a living hell for those people because the FDA had every question in the book, like ready and waiting for them, just tearing them apart. And somehow Betty Cell got accepted in the United States. But Betty Cell, so now, we, now we've made a cool drug, right? And look, we want to help people. So we want to make that drug affordable. Oh, it takes a billion dollars to yeah. make a new cell therapy. Ridiculous. So now we're making this four million, we're making a, a dose of this five million dollars a dose yeah which is is cra- the whole who can afford that no one no one can it's, afford it's, it it's, no one can afford it so that's like it's like a it's like a staunch reality like going into like wanting to make medicine help people is like there's people on the other side who are like you know mon- like met healthcare for profit is kind of crazy in my opinion but like that's just how the world is so yeah. if you can't beat them join them right so that's the that's what I'm just gonna say to you. Like, it's hard. It's really hard. I don't. You're do gonna you, do it. Do you know yeah. medical tourism? Have you heard of medical tourism? So like this issue of a five million dollar dose, in a country like India or China, they have not as rigorous of an ethical board where like yeah like here we do a lot of mouse testing first all mm-hmm. that stuff. But how translatable it is to humans is like always 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 the hardest thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the professors here told me that like. We've cured this cancer in mice a thousand times, but as soon as we try it in humans, there's something that doesn't click, mm-hmm. right? But in other countries, they don't have this FDA ethical board. Dude, in Africa, you can literally take people. Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't mean to be like really bad or like brutal about this, but like, like, if someone's like getting sick or dying, they will test it on them, and then, yeah. like that's how. So they in those countries, not only will they have it available, but it'll be cheaper. You don't have to go through all these hoops and stuff. And, like, your family member's dying. They're weeks away from dying. You're not going to argue with the FDA about why am I paying $5 million yeah, for right. something that will expand their life by two years, like two, three years, versus me going abroad, right? getting a treatment. So the that's like, called medical tourism. The, oh, like, gotcha. biggest example of medical tourism that I can say is on the south side of the Texas border or Arizona border in Mexico. There's literally like little pop-up towns and it's all Mexican doctors and they're like dentists mm-hmm. or like, you know, OBGYNs or like eye doctors. Like, Os- uh, yeah, ophthalmologists. Plastic, plastic surgeons? Some plastic surgeons. But they don't, they don't require insurance in Mexico. So you have people from the United States who can't afford, who like don't want to pay in health insurance, just go across the border if like they need a filling. Because the filling here is like $150. They'll do the filling for 25 bucks in Mexico. Is it a little? Probably way cheaper though. Uh huh. I mean, like, think of like you got to make it the whole round trip tickets, food, everything has to. It's like it really is the overall more cheaper. But like in, in a way. 
but like that's like the crazy part is like even for like those small little things like getting tested for your prescription to go get my to go get new glasses it would all probably must be like three hundred fifty dollars for me mm-hmm. like with insurance like that's crazy I gotta be that's able wild. to see so yeah not to discourage anybody who is like looking to do medicine or make medicine but it's a harsh reality it really is yeah. but that's not to stop you or anybody because I work in a lab that focuses on you know, repurposing drugs to use for different diseases, mm-hmm. right? Like, I work in, with medicine. Mm-hmm. Heem has worked in like, with nanomedicine and nanotechnology and delivery systems. Mm-hmm. You've worked with AML. Like, we all have the same common goal. It's just really expensive. Yeah. <laughs> just crazy. Yeah, no, the, the price of these therapies is kind of ridiculous sometimes. That's one of the things my mom's talking to me about. She writes a lot of grants, mm-hmm. medical grants, you know, because um, she is the director of clinical trials. Um, in the hospital she works at Um, and she was showing me some of the paperwork and like the tables comparing like treatment across treatment press across adults and kids and Mm -hmm. I think it was like twofold in kids which is ridiculous Mm -hmm. what was twofold in kids the 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 price price of treatment like for for car t-cell yeah which how is a family going to pay like 550k to save their kid's life like it's crazy. It's crazy. It's exploitation. But it is exploitation. Like, there's some hope, though, because there's something called Alpha Clinics in California. Alpha. They're actually, they were a thing pre-COVID, but, like, I think in 2019 or 18 or something, they got shut down. But they were basically the company that said, hey, look, we understand medical tourism exists. We don't want you to go out there, and we also need to test our drug. So if you come to our clinic, we'll give you unapproved treatments but it'll be way cheaper, and these are stem cell stuff, these are gene therapy stuff, but it's kind of like that middle ground. Yeah. And actually recently, in like literally the past few months, they like reopened, so they're really trying to like start that up again. The other reason that like medicine and like cell therapies are so expensive is because people are going after like these like diseases that only have like hundreds if not thousands of people like we're not talking like for the masses like curing the flu or like yeah. making like a vaccine for like hep e or whatever mm. like people are going after like people with beta thalassemia which is like a very specific subset of people yes. in the mediterranean and who might have migrated to the united states mm. right so you're talking like hundreds of thousands of people in a billion dollars like it's a company they have to make a profit and that's why the medicine is so expensive but like you know, ibuprofen and Advil. Like, everybody has a headache. Everybody has pain and inflammation. So, like, they can sell that for $5 a bottle with 100 tablets in it. True. And they know they're going to make it. And it's, like, really easy to make, too. It's acetaminophen. Mm-hmm. You no, know, acetaminophen's Tylenol. But, yeah. but that's that's the, kind of the explanation for it. And, like, anybody who might be wondering, like, why we always talk about expensive medicine, that's really why. It's, like, the business part. Like, they invest so much money in. They get so many investors. They have to pay those investors back, and the company has to make profit. So, it's a wild network. It's crazy. It like everybody's like, oh, like you just make a drug, you test it, and then you give it to people. It's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, There's so uh, much more. There's so much more. Even medical devices, like what Butter was talking about mm-hmm. when she was on here. We have a girl on RGME. She works with. Uh, a team from UH in a lab at Case. At VA. Is at the VA? It is at the VA, not UH. It's at the VA. And they make this, like, sensor that goes on, like, your carotid artery, and they're testing it on pigs. And it can sense when, like, your blood pressure's high, and it's made for people who have really high blood pressure. Mm-hmm. And it actually sends, like, a little shock of, like, electrical stimulation, and it causes it to, like, vasodilate. Wow. So it lowers the blood pressure, and then it can sense when, like, the blood pr- when the heart rate's gone down and the blood pressure's lowered. So then it can, like, constrict again and get it to normal, like, you know, kind of like homeostasis. That's interesting. They're all, they've been doing it on pigs for, like, what, now, a year? And then probably I won't see human trials for another two years or yeah. year, maybe a year, right? And it's just, it just takes time. It it's takes money. Process. And imagine, imagine paying for, for the animals and paying for all the surgery equipment and just, like, to even create something. So it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. But what... How much fun is it, though? It's so fun. It's so interesting. It keeps yeah. you motivated. It keeps you on your toes. It always does. Mm-hmm. I've run studies where I'm like, this is going to go great, and it doesn't. So Yeah. And I think that's where, like, working 
together with people like in your lab is really important like when I was um at the night over the summer and they would always talking about okay like what are we going to do once this gets to trials like how are we going to go about this and it just shows that research and medicine in general it's it's a team sport you know oh yeah 100 percent. yeah there's a ton of there's a ton of labs here at case that collaborate and they're like awesome collaborations like fit for this like it's almost like the stars like lined up and like the right people are just working with mm-hmm. everybody at the same time and there's some really cool stuff going on here i don't know like, I don't know how much you know about, like, CAR T-cells, yeah. but, like, Dr. Wald, he works in Wolstein. He's, like... He's a CAR T guy. He's, he's a CAR T guy. He's, like, ridiculous. All like, the immunology professors know him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, he's so wicked. He's so wicked. Smart. And the stuff that his lab does is awesome. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's crazy to work on the same floor as him. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, there, there's, so much, there's so much cool stuff happening here. I can't even imagine what's happening, like, out west... Especially like those biotech research companies and everything. Crazy. Would you want to go into industry one day? Or do you want to be a doctor, like stay hospital? What do you mean industry? Like so So like go work for like a biotech company. Like go like go like be like a project manager and create new medicines with like a corp like corporations yeah. and money and everything. Yeah. I used to want to do that. I used to wanna like make drugs. Mm-hmm. Um and but ever since, uh, like, my experience um, in senior year, I, like, I kind of just want to work with kids and, yeah, in the hospital. Stay in the hospital? Inpatient, yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's really cool. All you need is a little motivating thing, dude. To really right. Yeah, it's yeah just, just to, to keep you yeah. keep you on track. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, I did a lot of um, shadowing this uh, over winter break. Um, I looked at adults, hemonc, and also um, pediatric hemonc. Mm-hmm. This was in uh, the BMT unit. So really sick people getting sent there for, like, emergency transplant. And I just, I, I came there to, like, learn, and I came out, like, making a new friend in the unit, you know? Yeah. It's, it's just, it's so heartwarming, and you develop such, like, such a, deep like connection with your patient and my mom was telling me like she is she still keeps in touch with some of her patients from like a decade ago That's so amazing. um i think it's just really fulfilling i think biotech is very cool very fascinating but there's something about you know actually working with the patient um that i you can't really trade anything for no me. i agree it's, you know um, something interesting it's Kind of relate to what you're saying. So with like transplants and everything, you, they're gotta be on immunosuppressive drugs for a little bit, right? Yeah. To let the transplant just kind mm-hmm. of fully happen. In India, like let's say like so my aunt, she successfully had bone marrow transplant done and everything, but because like it is just like a very dusty, dirty like there's no like clean cleanliness standard for, in like the hospitals. There's like a little suspicion in our family that like she did really well she survived intense chemotherapy without having any anesthesia by the way oh all that stuff insane and then like she successfully accepted the graft but we think it's like it was a regular pathogen from the outside yeah. where her immune system couldn't respond because it's, mm-hmm. it's you you suppressed it to try gone, the graft yeah. to let the graft happen but in family visiting and nurses coming in and out dust coming in and out she could have passed away from something very, very common, yeah. which mm-hmm. is insane to think about. It's yeah. insane to think about. Yeah. It yeah. is. Well. Yeah. It's crazy. It's like some well, things you don't think about, and I know, I, I really appreciate just like the medical system here in the U.S. Yeah. So yeah. It's, pre- it's, it's great. I think we have a lot to be thankful for, but I think there's a lot of work to be done. Oh, yeah. So um, with equity and oh, just everything. <laughs> Just everything. Just like, like we were talking about, like the prices of treatment. Like, if a kid whose family is under the poverty line gets AML, what are they gonna do? You know, mm-hmm. for like first they gotta actually like, go to the hospital and be diagnosed. And it's, right, and that's expensive. Well, yeah, true. It's, it's true. It's um, excuse me. It's hard Sorry. to fix. Yeah. Well. Yeah, we're really inspired by what you're doing with like the whole um, blood drive. 
They you want to shout it out so cool. really quick again? What is it called? Yeah, what's it called? Be the match. Be the, Be match. the match. At CWRU. Yes. At CWRU. We'll, definitely, uh, we'll yeah. definitely link it for I everybody. We'll put that on LinkedIn and, yeah. tw- and whatever else we post on, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. But that's great. Well, thanks for coming on, Jake. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, for sure, man. You know, good luck with the rest of your semester. Appreciate it. Have fun in Oregon, hopefully. <laughs> all that stuff goes fun, all the AML research. Do you work with mice at all? Kinda. Kinda. I'm not trained, but I You can take the yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> I can. All right. Well we'll we'll talk about that after. But we just want to say thank you guys for watching, you know, us. We wanna again thank Jake for coming on. Like we like, you know, if you made it this far, our goal with this thing is to like get a lot of different people's perspective on not only regenerative medicine, but just the process in general. Whether it's an undergrad who might not know exactly what a stem cell is, or you know what a stem cell is, but like you know, doesn't okay, like is not as familiar with like the the industry. drug regulation, drug regulation and industry process as we are. Like it's interesting to hear and kind of like you know it sheds light on someone who is here, you know, in in like the center, you know, the National Center of Regenerative Medicine still, you know, might not have all the know, and we absolutely do not have all the know. Yeah, but. Okay, I'm rambling way yeah. too much. I just want to say thank you guys for watching another episode of Self Cell. My name is Nick. We want to say thank you to Jake and that team, and we'll see you next time. See you guys.